I'm very pleased to have been asked to come out here, not just to escape uh, the brutal cold that we're having in, in, in the East, but I've been passionate about this topic, I guess, for most of my adult life. Uh, it's been wonderful to connect with friends and colleagues here who feel the same, and for the last two days I've been immersed in discussions, uh, looking at uh, uh, situations in Toronto and Vancouver and comparing them, learning as much as um, I hope to, uh, or more than I hope to offer tonight, and I look forward to uh, uh, Q&A and discussion with all of you after I make some comments. Um, while the urban transport issues in Metro Vancouver and Greater Toronto differ in a number of important ways, there are enough similar challenges that I believe you will find our experience interesting and relevant. Well, here's the starting point in that video, which we tried to capture the, the key points in our report in two minutes, for those that wanted the uh, uh, brief, briefer version. The starting point is that we're a, a city region of about 6.5 million, and we're going to grow by another 2.5 million over the next 18 years. Think of taking the entire metro region of Vancouver, metro Vancouver, and plunking it right on top of our city. That's the size that we're going to grow in the next 18 years. Uh, it means that we've reached a tipping point in congestion on our roads and crowding on transit, it, because it means, an, and it means another million more cars on our roads in this period. Because we've neglected transit infrastructure for so long, the impending influx of people and cars makes for a situation that's totally intolerable. Now, it's interesting that we have consensus in my city region on the urgency for action. Ironically and sadly, everybody agrees that this is a crisis. And at the same time, we are totally agreed that no one wants to pay for it. That's what makes it awkward. Now, this trip has been a bit nostalgic for me. I remember when GVRT was in the process of creating TransLink, Bob. And that was in the 90s. And at that, that time, I was engaged in this report on the future of the city of Toronto and wrestling with similar issues. And my task force at that time, what we were focused on was how do we integrate land use and transportation planning. And at that time, of course, we were expecting our population to reach 6 million people by 2021. Well, we've already exceeded that. So all of the projections, in fact, are not overstated but understated. So I came to Vancouver. Part of the mandate was fixing the property tax system. You had something called actual value assessment, so I came up out here, and I met with Ken Cameron, who was a colleague when I was in Ontario and is here tonight, and uh, I wanted to catch up on GVRD's livable region strategic plan, and that was when you, when you were in the process of creating TransLink. So I was, I was calling for a new regional government in the GTA that would make possible coordinated decision-making on all region-wide matters, but specifically including la land use planning and transportation uh, planning and development. And it was Vancouver that was leading the way, first by creating the region-wide GVRD, then by creating the Liverpool Region Plan, followed by your creation of TransLink, and, I should mention, with your land use policies. Because while in Toronto we have continued to sprawl relentlessly, you have preserved your agricultural land and developed policies on intensification that are more ambitious than anything we've considered in our area. So here I am, 18 years later, talking about how do we fund and integrate uh, a plan to integrate land use planning and transportation planning for a metropolitan region, in my case, without the benefit of a region-wide government or body, and how to make that happen. So as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, in some ways, it's deja vu all over again. The transit plan, uh, panel's terms of reference said that our mandate was to review the Metrolink's investment strategy and give the province our advice on funding tools. But the real motive, I think, was to try to contribute to breaking the political gridlock. There had been several reports. You had the Metro Region, the Metro Region Board of Trade. They just changed their name from the Metro Toronto Board of Trade to the Region Board of Trade. You had a City of Toronto staff report. You had the Metrolinx report, which recommended uh, a strategy consisting of 1% uh, of the HST, parking, uh, tax, development fees, and a gas tax. And understandably, the Premier was not comfortable with this. First of all, the various proposals weren't in 100% agreement. And, you know, given our situation there politically, it was a very, very... Uh, um, 
she, she doesn't have a majority government, so it's very difficult for her, so she, she asked uh, us to take this on. Privately, she said to us that what she wanted to do was see if we could use, uh, move the yardstick on public opinion a bit through the process. So what I want to do today, tonight is three things. I want to describe the context for our report. I want to present the key findings briefly, and then I want to talk about lessons learned. Now, because you're in suspense, I don't want to keep you in suspense. I can see that there might be some suspense. What is the lessons learned? I'm going to briefly mention them now, but I'm going to elaborate on them later. So the three lessons that I wanted to highlight, and I will highlight at the end, are first of all the role of the media. I found the media reaction to our report somewhat frustrating, and in the two days that I've had here, I can see that communication and getting messages out is a common issue that we have. The broadcast media, the night that we released our report was, and, I, and the interesting thing is we had done interviews all day long, and we had a briefing, and then we had these in-depth interviews, and I was sort of watching the broadcast news to, because I thought we'd done a pretty good job on all these interviews, and basically it was, oh my God, they're going to raise the gas tax. That was... <laughs> And the print and press editorials and columns were mostly praising the report. Some of them described our report as breaking new ground, doable, and practical. So that part was okay. The second issue is trust. When trust is broken between the government and the governed, it is almost impossible to generate support for public policy, no matter how good the proposals are. And the third lesson is governance. There's no easy answer with respect to transportation governance. No template that I'm going to propose as a model. I have followed your experience with TransLink governance, and I know that you too have struggled and are struggling with the challenge of creating an ideal system that achieves effectiveness and efficiency across the region, comprising several municipalities, and at the same time adheres to the principles of responsiveness and accountability. I just want to say that this is a challenge, in my experience, that besets all metropolitan regions. But more on this later. Back to the context. When Premier Wynne and Minister Glenn Murray asked me to lead a panel to advise the government on how transit in the GT Hamil Greater Toronto Hamilton area, I may refer to it as GTHA, but Greater Toronto Hamilton area, should be funded, my reaction was twofold. It was hesitant, and at the same time, I was excited. Why was I hesitant? The timing was very tight. They needed a fast turnaround so I could get the report in so they could, if they wanted to, incorporate it into their February 2014 budget. So when I say tight, it was within three months. Secondly, they'd already chosen the panel. They had chosen 11 people, plus myself would be 12, and I wanted to bring on Paul Bedford, whom you met in the video, and that would make it 13. And they showed you how the variety of backgrounds on the video, but I had Tory and ND, Tories and NDP, I had people from the trucking industry, the development industry. I couldn't figure out how they were going to agree on anything, let alone a plan to trans, uh, fund transit. And then we have the political context, and let me just say in our city, it's daunting. <laughs> we had a minor in private, we can describe, discuss it later. We had a minority government at Queen's Park. We had a mayor at City Hall doing his best to mislead the public on transit and other matters. No doubt you've heard of him. <laughs> but I knew I had to accept the invitation. Transit infrastructure is an issue that I've cared about deeply for two decades or more, actually more. It was highlighted in my report that we did on the, GT, uh, on the, on the GTA back in 1996, which I mentioned that was the reason why we had recommended a second tier or the extrapolation of the metropolitan Toronto model. It was a major uh, theme in the work that you mentioned, Bob, on my uh, report on cities for the conference board. And it is one of the cornerstones uh, for success uh, in, that I include in the course that I'm currently teaching on cities at Ryerson. So when the Premier announced the panel, of course, uh, so, so, I, was, so I, I had to accept. I had no choice. For me, I just, it was another opportunity to uh, really think about this issue and see if I could make a contribution. But when the Premier announced the panel, I, I cannot overstate how negative the reaction was. I, I would say, I always say out of, 105 peop out of 100 people, 105 thought it was you know, an off-ramp for the government. Uh, the initial reaction from the media was very cynical, from the public was very cynical, and I think most people felt that the government was using the panel to postpone making a decision uh, on revenue tools. At the same time, we had a transit fracas in our area over a proposed new line. 
I don't know how many of you have heard of the Scarborough line in Toronto, and I don't know how many of you have been to Toronto or know our situation, but Scarborough is, is one of the six municipalities that um, were forced together under amalgamation that are now part of the city. And it was dominating the news. Our agency, TransLink, had recommended a light rapid transit system, which is what the demand would justify. In other words, the ridership. That was the correct, in my view, uh, uh, recommendation. But uh, our mayor, um, subways, 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 and don't worry about paying for them because we can pay for them from waste, um, was actually succeeded in getting the city council to turn the decision around. And then Metrolinx changed its decision. The province intervened. It was just... Um, really chaotic, and that confirmed the public's distrust in how transit decisions are made. It, it was, and that was the exact backdrop for our work. But the interesting thing is the panel was not cynical, and I was really wrong about something. I thought, how could 13 people from with different political stripes from all parts of the region who never, most of us didn't even know each other well, how could we possibly make this happen in 12 weeks? We met the first night. We, they took us on an eight-hour tour. We went to... We have lots going on in Toronto, by the way. $16 billion worth of construction right now is, is, is underway. But we went on a tour, and then we went out to dinner after. And for three hours... And I just asked everyone, why had they accepted? And each person poured their heart out as to their passion for... Their, their understanding of why a great city needs to have a, a, a network and why they personally were going to give of their time, etc., um, and we kind of bonded at that, and we agreed that we were not going to uh, duplicate what was being done, and we were going to tell the truth. We were going to tell the truth. And uh, something really quite wonderful happened. We, we, um, we were, were going to build on the research of, of Metrolinx. We weren't going to try to redo what they had done, even though we had been asked to redo the consultations. So there was absolutely no, no need. And we were going to try to redo, produce a report that, as we said in the video, was practical and doable, and viable, both in terms of the substance and politically. Now, I believe we've done so. I, I may sound immodest, but I actually uh, believe very much in what we produced. I also think that producing a consensus report with the unanimous support of all 13 of us, representing all the major stakeholder groups from across the spectrum, has been, uh, ha has been something that the Premier has noticed, uh, taken note of, and uh, was a real achievement. And, and what I'm hoping, and what I did say to our Premier, is I'm hoping that the unanimity of support will give heart to our government to act on our recommendations in the upcoming budget, which will be either uh, February or March, so it's pretty soon. So our plan. It's simple and it works. It starts, as you heard on the video, with a few revenue tools to create a viable revenue stream. And this is the key to the report that made us different from all the other proposals that had gone forward. Instead of trying to raise the $2 billion or $3 billion needed every year to support this $50 billion plus plan, we were suggesting that you raise less than that, but because it's a new revenue stream, you borrow against it and then you would not affect the province's credit rating. The province of Ontario has a huge deficit, and we're borrowing to the point that if we borrow more, it will lower our credit rating, which will then increase the cost of money and, make every, and put us into further deficit. So by suggesting that we create a new revenue stream using a new tax set of taxes, gas, the half a point of uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, income tax, plus the uh, redeployment of the HST on the gas tax, that $1.8 billion would then be levered at a rate of about two and a half times, which is very low. Normally, when you're in the business world, those of you that are in business know that you can usually borrow 10 to 1 against a new dollar stream, but we kept it low um, to be very, very conservative. Um, and it actually yields enough money. It unlocks the billions of dollars needed to build the highest priority next wave projects all within the coming decade. We felt our revenue plan was fair because it called for a contributions from all stakeholders, but it did not ask for too much from any one group. But before going into the details of the strategy, I just want to say a word about how our thinking evolved, because it is relevant to what you're facing here. After weeks of orientation and reading all of the reports, which was as high as that table, um, we met with dozens of stakeholder groups, and we organized public meetings. And we had to focus the discussion, and that's why we came up with a paper that some of you have read uh, called Hard Truths About Transit. 
And when I talked on the phone with the organizers, Frank and, and, and Gord, uh, they did say that I should repeat these hard truths because I can see that even though we put out this paper and everybody said, gee, that's really good, um, we still hear these myths repeated. I certainly do in my region. What is the first truth? Subways are not the only good form of transit. What matters is matching the transit mode and technology to the proposed route to avoid waste, to, uh, so that you don't, you don't waste the scarce capital, so that you don't reduce the funds available for other projects, and that you don't create a debt that burdens you for generations. Second truth, transit does not automatically drive development. People kept saying, well, yeah, there's nobody there, and right, we won't have riders now, but if you build it, they will come. No. To be successful, transit routes must connect with current and anticipated employment. And this has not been sufficiently recognized. Third, the cost of building the transit is not the major expense. Every time our mayor talked about what's only going to cost this much, he talked about the cost of construction. They did not talk about the cost of financing. They did not talk about the cost of operating or maintenance. This must all be taken into consideration. And we produced a chart in the report showing for each mode of transit what the real costs are. And I'm proud of this report, this chart, because it was the first time anywhere that people can see the true costs of transit construction. And that might be of interest uh, to, to the folks here, uh, Bob. Fourth truth, transit riders are not the only beneficiaries of the new transit infrastructure. Very often in the public media you read, well, why should I have to pay? I'm not a transit user. And the answer is because you benefit as a driver. How In our area, we're already... The worst, we have already have the worst congestion anywhere in the developed world, uh, uh, certainly in North America. Uh, I shouldn't say anywhere in the, well, in the developed world, uh, certainly in North America. When we do the benchmarking on this, uh, we actually, three years ago, we actually got uh, our average congestion, uh, uh, travel time to and from work, the average commute, exceeded Los Angeles. Now, there's an honor. So if, if we don't actually entice people out of their cars uh, onto transit, the million, where are the million new cars going to go that are coming into the region? You won't be able to move uh, goods or people. So everyone benefits, drivers, employers, everyone. And everyone benefits economically, and they benefit socially, and they benefit environmentally. And these benefits are spelled out in the report. Um, uh, I don't have time to do it tonight, but it's worth reading because th there's a page or two spelling out these benefits in some detail. The fifth truth is that transit expansion in the region is not at a standstill. Part of the myth was nothing's happening, but it's not true. There's currently $16 billion worth of transit construction in progress, and so it, the public perception is wrong. We have a huge region, and people don't see what's happening. Uh, I, when I came in yesterday, I, I came down the Canada line, and it was great that you have this connection from the airport uh, right to downtown. We will have our own by 2015, maybe, um, in time for the Pan Am Games. It's going to be a businessman's line. It's going to be quite expensive, business person's line. Pardon. Um, but it's, uh, um, we will have that line, hopefully, uh, by then. Uh, but there is lots under construction. Now, this is the biggest myth. We can't pay, uh, that, that, that we can pay uh, for the um, region, uh, the, the transit that we need by, by cutting waste. The sixth truth is we cannot pay for the region-wide transit we need by cutting waste in government alone. New dedicated revenue sources are required. Now, I repeat this, and I'll take a minute on this, because this is the mantra. It's the mantra of the mayor, and it's the mantra of the leaders of the opposition parties that are uh, vying to uh, become the next premiers. And it's a problem because people believe it. Um, so we spent some time on this. What could be cut? Where's the waste? And I, I'm just going to uh, give you a few facts um, that, that point out why this gravy train myth doesn't work. First, Ontario already has the lowest spending per capita of all of the provincial governments in the country. Secondly, spending has been reined in significantly. Growth in program spending in Ontario has been reined in to less than 1% per year. Now, those of you in government know that that's very hard to do, particularly with the cost of health care growing up until recently in Ontario, 8% a year, up until the last two years. And... 
uh, with inflation being at least, you know, what, 1.75, soon will be 2%, um, and probably is 2% because they don't count everything in inflation. So uh, to keep your government costs less than the rate of inflation is a real trick. But Ontario has been doing this, and that's the forecast. Third, Ontario is committed to eliminating this big deficit, the deficit that is the result of the money that they put into the economy to support the economy in 2007 and 2008 following first the real estate collapse and then the fiscal collapse. And uh, personally, I believed that those funds were necessary and uh, we're paying that off. Um, Finally, we actually did some calculation. Even if the government chose to sell off land, that was we heard, well, why don't they just sell this or sell that, sell this capital asset, and that'll pay for... Well, you can't, anybody, again, who knows accounting, you can't sell a capital asset and count it as you know, operating. Um, and even the rule of 10 to 1 doesn't work very well. Uh, it would not create the revenue stream that would fund the transit that we need. Finally... Dalton McGuinty, before he ceased being Premier, had asked Don Drummond. Now, most of you know that Don Drummond was the uh, uh, TD Bank's former chief economist, also Deputy, uh, Minister, of fin Deputy Minister of Finance uh, in um, uh, uh, Ottawa for many years. Brilliant guy. He spent a year trying to find waste in government. He couldn't find sufficient waste. And he says in the report, we cannot find sufficient waste to fund the transit that we need you're going to need to create a new revenue stream. But these facts are ignored in the public discussion. Following the publication of this report, our panel began to gain some traction, and the media, um, I would say the tone of the media became more respectful. Um, the panel found, however, that we could not separate how to pay for new transit, which was what we were asked to do, from the process and criteria for selecting the projects themselves. The challenge for us, and this was tricky, was how to take uh, account of the new research, and I'll give you an example, new research is coming out right now, and again, I don't know if you guys are aware of this here at TransLink, but new research on, the re on, on employment patterns, and uh, the guy who is doing it for us, Ian Dobson, was a member of my panel, brand new stuff on how you look at employment patterns currently and future, and then we did overlays of the transit map, and it didn't fit, but we couldn't say that because we didn't want to undermine confidence in the big move, which was Metrolinx's plan, because it was the first time we had created a strategic vision for the region, in itself a marvelous accomplishment. So we wanted to point out that there some, had to, we had to make some changes and some tweaks without saying that we had to make changes. So the way we did that was... We didn't say that we had to change the plan. We supported the plan, but we said we have to look at how we prioritize the list. And then we set out our criteria for prioritizing, which would, in fact, affect the plan. But since the plan, the projects had not yet been prioritized, um, it was seen as helpful. In other words, going forward, this is how we can modify a bit what's there without throwing it out. So among these criteria... Are, the first one was that transit investments must help ease congestion. Now, I said to the staff who I met with at, Trans, at TransLink today, they must all be sitting there going like, yeah, duh, you know, it sounds so obvious. But the fact is, we were planning, or part of the big move plan is to extend the Young Street subway, which is our first subway. How many of you have been on the Young Street subway? You know, all right, everybody practically, most of you. So... They wanted to extend that subway straight up north into York Region up to Langstaff Road. That was a priority because the people there wanted it, right? But the congestion on the subway is so bad now that people go north in the morning to go south. Like they go to a north to get on the subway before Eglinton so that they can travel south. Because if you go to Eglinton, five trains can go by. You can't get on it, right? So they go north now. So imagine what's going to happen if we extend Young Street north without building the relief line at the bottom of the city to relieve the congestion. So we, when, we, when we put that point out there, it wasn't quite as obvious. And people say, oh, yeah, maybe we could think about that. They also must add up to a region-wide network. In my report, and some of you can just Google it, uh, just Google the transit panel and you'll see it. We have a map of the Big Move plan, and you'll see that the lines don't add up to a network. The lines, if you look at the fingers, sometimes they go out, but they don't have connectors across. So um, uh, we were saying the most important thing is to create a network. And again, it sounds obvious, but... If you re instead of that's code for 
build the relief line first. So, but without saying it. And we're also saying they have to align with employment centers. But if you build a relief line cleverly, you can do that. And you can make up for some of the things that were missed in the big move plan. To be fair, Metrolinx did not have advantage, the advantage of seeing this research that was just coming out that we did. So remember, their plan was created five years ago. So things change in transportation in five years. Um, and then we also said they have to be built on a practical timeline and account for all costs. There is such distrust about the accounting for transit that this was a big part of our report. At any rate, how we paid for it was, of course, the crux of our mandate. And I've already told you what the formula is. The main option is a phased increase of gasoline and fuel taxes. And we were going to, I'm going to be specific because it's important with this. I think most of you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't really care about this. So we would start with three cents a liter, uh, and it would rise after eight years to 10 cents, and, that, and it would be stopped, plus a half a point increase in the corporate income tax, plus the redeployment of the portion, the, the, uh, 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 the portion within the greater Toronto area of the provincial HST. Remember, we harmonized our HST a few years ago, and I believe you tried to do the same here. Interesting. Now, that's an interesting study in, in public opinion, because I'll be honest with you, I believe in the harmonization of the HSC. I think it was the right thing to do, and um, I believed your premier then had the right idea. But it wasn't successful. And again, it's an issue of how these things are communicated, it, it, and it's, it applies to the same issue of how do you, how do you uh, build a, tr a, funding, a sustainable funding plan for transit. Um, we actually had a second option, because one of the people on my panel was from the uh, Canadian Automobile Association. And this was the magnificence of my panel. Imagine being on the Canadian Automobile Association and the executive director of it, or whatever her title was. And we were coming out with a gas tax based, fuel, gas and fuel tax based plan. And I said, I took her aside and I said, Teresa, are you okay with this? She was on the video. She wanted to be on the video. I said, are you okay with this? She says, well, I'm not going to make friends where I work. She says, but it's the right thing to do. So that was the spirit of the panel. And that, I thought that. Uh, took a lot of courage, but we also developed a second plan for her that they could cap the gas tax at five, at five cents a liter and then put a half a point of HST on or something to compensate. Uh, my, my, my preference is not to take the HST at this point, but uh, at any rate, the, the main point of our plan is not what you use, but that you create a revenue stream and lever it to borrow and get the money, all the money that you need so you don't have to go back every year and get approval. You have a stream and you can implement and you can do it faster and accelerate and get it done uh, without adding, uh, without, uh, adding to a, a credit problem for the province. Um, so as I pointed out, it not, this, this plan not only raises enough money to build three-quarters of the big move plan, it, there's so much money generated by it initially that you have enough money to create a two-year kickstart program for local improvements that can be implemented to coincide with the introduction of the gas tax. So people can say, oh, yes, I have to pay three cents more. But on the other hand, look what I, I just got at my, all my bus stops now have information that will tell me when the next bus is there, like it's only one minute away or two minutes away, like say like they have everywhere in Paris or other places in the world, and, or that they now have on the subways, uh, and at least in Toronto. Uh, or uh, maybe in, some, in one of the municipalities they could say, oh, now we have nice transit stops that you know, protect us from the rain or whatever. So you could see local improvements at the same time as this uh, tax was being implemented. Um, Anyway, we, we did extensive, what's interesting, by the way, the, in terms of the reaction of the gas, against the gas tax, is that since this report was handed to the Premier on December 18, the price of gas has gone up five cents, not three cents, five cents in Toronto. Has anybody noticed? No. <laughs> but the notion that we were going to impose a three cent uh, increase per litre on the gas tax was uh, uh, deemed to be too, quite terrible. Anyway, we did a lot of research on all the tools, and because I know you're trying to create your own um, plan, I'm just going to comment briefly on why we didn't choose other methods. We favored the gas and fuel taxes for the simple reasons that they matched usage, they affect travel behavior potentially, that they're simple to administer, they raise a lot of money, and unlike in your province, they have not been raised in our area in more than 20 years. It was 14 and a half cents 
the 14 and a half cents per liter. When it was imposed 20 plus years ago, gas was 40 cents a liter. Gas is now a dollar 30 or now probably a dollar 35 in my area and it's still 14 and a half cents. So we felt there was room. Um, even when you added on the potentially 10 cents increase, um, they'll still be below other gas. Will, the gas taxes will still be below jurisdictions like Montreal, or the same, in fact, as what Vancouver's are now. Uh, so we then looked at the impact on households, and we did a lot of work on this, and we showed that in the first year, the impact on the average household. And we looked at the average size car, with the average how many you know how many cars and size of motor and all the rest of it, filling up your gas tank once a week it would be $80 increase per year. Much less than any increase in HST, which would be on everything from haircuts to you know, products. After eight years, if it went to 10 cents, it would be $260 a year, right? So then we said, okay, what does it cost to have your car idle in congestion and not go anywhere and add 32 um, minutes a day, which is projected, every single day? That's what's going to happen if we don't do anything, right? So... We actually calculated this, and it's $16 a week or $800 a year. So to me, it was amazing that how the media focused on one side of the equation. They said, oh, it's going to cost you $80 more a year. How do you feel about that? But they don't say, if you don't do it, it's going to cost you $800 more. That never came out. Although I, I, on every radio show, I, I said it over and over, but... Uh, that, that was that, <laughs> we, couldn't get it, we couldn't get it publicized broadly enough. Anyway... I believe the choice is obvious. I believe it's obvious for us anyway. We can all pay a little now or a whole lot later. And I think it's a fair solution uh, for business too um, because employers will benefit from, from the employees, both because employees will be more productive and had a better commute, but also a better labor pool. There's a lot of people in our area that can't get to the jobs because they can't, they don't have a car. And so they can't take those jobs. We have companies moving that moved out to where the land was cheaper, that are moving back into Toronto to access a better labor pool. So when we met with the corporate leaders twice, and when we explained this to them, they did agree. And I have to say, uh, in discussing alternatives with them, like an employer-paid payroll tax, like they use in New York, they came to see the benefit of the, uh, of the approach we were taking. Now, I think I may be overstating that. I, I can't say that they cheered us on and said, yes, do that. But what they didn't say was, don't do that. So I took that as an affirmative. Um, and, and also, uh, even with a half a point increase in the corporate income tax, Ontario's general CIT rate, corporate income tax rate, still remains in the bottom half of all the provinces. Now, we also think highway tolls. We had a lot of people saying, what about highway tolls? People, for some reason, actually think to tolls are better than gas tax, even though tolls will cost more. Why do they think that? I think it's because they think in one way or another not, they're not going to take that route. Um, so I learned today when I was taking my tour with, uh, with uh, uh, Ken and um, uh, Tamim that uh, one, of your, one of your bridges there is tolled and one of them isn't tolled. So when tolls were introduced, some people said, well, maybe I could use the other bridge, right? So that's what happens. When, with tolls, people think, well, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll find another way around it. Um, the point about tolls for us was that uh, it's the high cost and the high lead time to actually put it. It would take two years to get the thing going, and it would be another two-year delay. Furthermore, they would have to toll every road. They would have to toll all the roads that are already built, and that's never been done. Mostly when they introduce tolls, it's on a new road to create the illusion that they're paying for the new road only. Now, road pricing is, is going to be needed eventually down the line, uh, down the road, I should say. Well, <laughs> that was... Well. Oh, that was a, I, didn't even, I didn't even appreciate that when I wrote that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's the norm in major global city regions today, and, and we do live in one of these. Anyway, um, the most common and forceful message we, we received in all the public meetings is the public has very little trust in how transit decisions are made. I, I was a little bit surprised at how cynical everybody was, but I heard it over and over again. And one person stood up at one of the public meetings and, and in his best soprano voice said, hey, dedicated or forget about it. <laughs> so we actually entitled it dedicated or forget about it. Um, so we addressed this concern head on in our recommendations uh, and, and so our recommendations, when, and I believe these will be enacted, ensure that the new revenue is held in a standalone fund within Metrolinx 
because if you create it outside Crown Corporations, it adds on to it creates other problems. But they will be spent solely on f funding transit expansion and renewal in our city region. And we will guarantee accountability and transparency for how the funds are collected, spent, and reported on. Now, these recommendations could still apply to TransLink. You don't have to create a, a fund to do it. But I think that if you look in the detailed recommendations that we have on how to make this transparent, I think it would help. I think people would like, even if they don't read it, they would like to know that it, they could. And how do we encourage the depoliticizing of decision making? Now that's a tricky question. I was asked that last night when I met with the TransLink board and, and uh, 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 some officials. And um, I answered last night and I said, you know, you, you don't want to depoliticize all decision makings because the odd time the politicians will come in not just the odd time, I say, with respect to the politicians here, off time, sometimes, well, I'll say sometimes. The politicians will come and, and they'll make the right decision on top of what the so-called experts have decided. Um, but in our situation, the po politicizing is going too far, far because what they're doing is making decisions unimpaired, un unimpaired by any information. And, and so one of the things that's in my area, this is only in my area, um, and, and so one of the things we've recommended is that the politicians, nobody, that decisions cannot be made without published business case analysis. So that people can say, oh, I see, there is a business case analysis here. So for example, the Scarborough decision, which absolutely makes no sense, nobody could argue that it does, and even the people who support it don't argue that it makes sense in terms of ridership. Nobody argues that. Even Karen Stintz, whom I admire, and she's a mayoral candidate, came out and she switched to favor it. I said, why would you do that? And she said, because you have to understand Scarborough does not feel part of the city. It's important that it feels part of the city. Well, I, I, I want it to feel part of the city, but it's a big cost for ridership that's never going to happen. Um, it's, it, the the subway is going to go through what is essentially a bedroom community, and it, it will not have the ridership that could be justified that should, you know, by a subway. So I think you have, if we publish business case analysis, at least we'll change the discussion. We can't say what the decisions, maybe people will say, yeah, I agree with Karen that we really, that the self-esteem needs here validate the decision. And that may be the right thing. I'm not putting it, no, I don't mean to be pejorative, I mean it sincerely, that that might be the right decision for those reasons. But at least you'd know the reasons why, and we wouldn't, uh, we'd have a better discussion. Now, in my area, when I, when I made this point, not all the politicians were, were in love with this particular point. Um, but it seems to me that if we're wasting money as we did on our Shepherd line, those of you that know Toronto know that we, we don't call it a subway, we call it a stubway because it doesn't actually go anywhere. But as I say, you know, the good thing is you can always get a seat on it, you know. Um, but we're subsidizing, we're subsidizing that ride by estimates are from between 10 and $18 per person per ride. Now, I think if people knew that, they wouldn't feel so great about having, you know, the, uh, those empty seats. And so I think part of building trust is not wasting billions of dollars. Uh, and, and by building the transit that's appropriate for the situation, that generates uh, sufficient ridership, that addresses congestion, and that contributes to an integrated network. And if you can say that, then that is how, in part, you build trust, by the doing of the deed. Now, governance. We wrestled with governance questions. Some say that the way to depoliticize decision making would be to expand the authority and mandate of Metrolinx. Now we're different than you uh, in that Metrolinx, um, we, we don't have a GVRD. We, don't, we, we did momentarily. Um, there was a report in 1996 that recommended a region-wide government. Sadly, that recommendation by moi Mem was not accepted. Um, and uh, so we don't have a region-wide government. Um, so you have this disembodied metro links there that reports only to the Ministry of Transportation. And uh, some people are saying, give it all the teeth it needs, make it like an airport authority. Let it be totally independent, unconnected to politics. Well, I would say be careful what you're asking. For me, uh, these, these decisions on transit affect property values. I mean, they're hugely important. They affect the quality of life as much as anything I can think of in a city. Surely. You want to have political influence. Um, our Metrolinx, by the way, does not have the power to tax. It has no independent revenue source either. 
and, uh, and, and in our situation, I think we count on local municipalities to, to represent the local community perspective. That's the whole purpose of local government. And I believe in local government, and I think it's an important principle in our system of governance. But the challenge in a metropolitan region is how do you strike a reasonable balance, a workable balance between local responsiveness and region, regional coordination? That's why we supported the Metrolink's recommendation to add six municipally appointed uh, people to our board, but they cannot be politicians. We did look at your model of a mayor's advisory council. Um, and we've always been impressed by TransLink, um, but um, I will go on with my lessons in governance in a few, in a few minutes, very few minutes. We also looked at how do you capture land value because when you, uh, there's a value uplift when you put in infrastructure. So how do you capture that? How do you uh, recoup from the developers part of the value uplift that they received? The thing is that you cannot count on that for as a reliable revenue source. Our minister wanted us to find that, but I was unable to. I think properly planned, transit investments can encourage development around transit stations and transit routes. We looked in, um, in depth at the London Crossrail experience. How many of you are familiar with London Crossrail? An amazing story. And there, the private sector paid about 5 billion euros, or not pounds, sorry, not euros, pounds, of, this, of the 14, it's a 14 or 16 billion euro cost of that. Well, that was huge, but I... That's a situation that cannot be replicated because, you know, that was um, a particular development. The Reichman brothers, they had a piece of land that was like landlocked from transit. They got behind the corporate community and they drove it. And it took years. It was a, a, a close to a $15 billion project. So one third of all the costs were contributed by business. So Metrolinx is starting to work a little bit more. And in our recommendations, we call upon Metrolinx to become more entrepreneurial and to be out there aggressively meeting, proactively meeting with developers, business, and seeing what they can do, either to get them to build the stations or to commit to some way of um, uh, collecting value, contributing perhaps to the cost of construction somehow. Um, normally you, the way they recoup is through higher property taxes that accrue from the higher value, but that's, you know, a slow chain to have happen. It doesn't happen right away. Um, another theme is, is, before I get to my lessons, is that all governments have a role to play. A common theme at all of our public meetings was that really the federal government in particular was seen as missing in action. That was a phrase of one of the participants. In our area, the federal funding is ad hoc. It does not support the long-term planning. Uh, sometimes they'll come in on an investment, like they came in on the Scarborough subway, but it was ad hoc of the moment, and in that case, not especially helpful. The famous urbanist Jane Jacobs observed, I knew Jane, and I, I, I sort, of, sort of hang on every word that she uh, has said, but I, I was with her when she said this. It was in Winnipeg at the C5 meeting, and she said, the large cities are Canada's major economic assets. Without Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, and she included Winnipeg because we were in Winnipeg. <laughs> Canada would be so poor that it would qualify as a third world country. Cities like ours, like Toronto and Vancouver, don't need to apologize for asking the federal government to participate. The Toronto city region contributes 20% of Canada's GDP. You contribute 6.5% of Canada's GDP. For Canada to achieve its potential, the government of Canada must become a full partner with a fair and reliable contribution to the funding of transit where it's needed. And we also talk in our report about municipalities playing a stronger role by ensuring that the planning policies that they have encourage new development that supports transit ridership through appropriate intensification. Tamim and I talked a lot about that today, uh, and we are specific on that. Guidelines have to be changed into policies with teeth. And they also, some of our cities, one or two can't, but most of them have capacity to actually borrow as well to help finance local improvements, and they're not utilizing the, the capacity that they have. Now, to me, the most enjoyable part of my experience in the past three months was that it was, it was possible to have a, a mature conversation about transit. And I, I think I came away feeling more strongly than ever that transit should not be about ideology. It should not be about drivers versus riders. It should not be about subways versus light rail. It is not about city versus suburb. This is an issue where we must all be on the same side. 
Now that the panel has fulfilled its mandate, we need new champions who will cont continue to communicate the importance of investing in transit, who will sustain a long-term, ongoing program of public education. This is why your program here, Gord, is so important, because that is what you are trying to do and why I have such respect for it. We need champions from governments, business, and civil society. We thought about the title of our report, Making the Move, Choices and Consequences, because it's both a call to action and a warning that failing to act has consequences too. And as I mentioned, we focus on the benefits of transit, the countless personal, micro and macro, economic and quality of life benefits that building the region-wide network provides. Our strategy is not just about transit, it's about transportation. It's about economics. It's pro-driver, pro-rider, pro-business, pro-economy, and pro-region. Well, let me close with some thoughts on what I learned from this process. First, on messaging. The messaging of public policy proposals is never easy, and it's more difficult than ever in our new world of communication. Actually, Ken, if I can use your phrase from the, today, we're into a, in a new world of ADD communication. Uh, it, that resonated with me. Um, with 24-7 digital distribution of news, there's no white space for thinking and analysis. Everything is real-time, sound bites. I noticed that when we called the lockup so that we could explain the intricacies of our recommendations, we deliberately had a lockup because it was complicated, right? The reporters wanted to tweet and file. They started to tweet and file. I had not handed out the report yet. I thought that was amazing that they were going to retweet the results before having one person say anything about it. Moreover, our, the social media makes instant experts of everybody. Everybody's opinion matters, right? There are no filters. Sometimes that's okay, but not when you ha want to have an adult, uh, an adult conversation on a complicated matter. Now, layer, on, layer onto this the pre-election political atmosphere in Ontario's minority government situation. I don't know if any of you remember uh, SCTV when John Candy was on it. Do, uh, do you remember, some of you remember that? And um, he was playing a, a person called Johnny LaRue. Remember Johnny LaRue? And some of you, the, Johnny would, they, there was a quiz show, and they would say, okay, and now here's the question, and Johnny would push his buzzer before the question was asked. And the, and the, and the uh, host would say, Johnny, you have to wait till I ask the question. And this happened over and over. Well, I, I feel sometimes I'm in that world. The broadcast media, all of them, showed a brief clip of our report. This is after an hour and a half briefing focusing on one thing, as I mentioned, the gas tax. And then they would go, and this is, I looked at all of the, you know, coverage. They go to some guy at a gas pump someplace, like at the remote end of the... Re <laughs> no, and they stick a microphone in his face and they say, how do you feel about the new tax on gas? So some, somewhat stunned, this is him on their thing, and he goes, huh? <laughs> uh, new tax. Uh, and then they said, well, didn't you hear there's going to be a new tax on gas to pay for transit? Uh, and then he would say something like, uh, not good. <laughs> and then, this is true, I'm not even making it up. And then the reporter, seeking confirmation of his story, who did he go to interview? Doug Ford and Rob Ford. <laughs> and what would they say? Because it would, of course, not be able to be predicted. And there they would get the colorful, uninformed, no way response. So... To me, the time and the space and the cost factors have combined to dumb down the broadcast media. Reading the commentaries of those who have been engaged on the com transit file for some time was more gratifying. Um, but the problem is that in our current culture in Toronto, people who are informed are dismissed as elites. And worse, elites who drink cappuccino. <laughs> so this is the challenge for modern democracies. How do you have these kinds of conversations in today's world? And it's a challenge for our journalistic institutions as well. As well, It's a challenge you're facing here in Vancouver with the proposed referendum on transit financing. Now, in one of life's many coincidences, I picked up the newspapers this morning to read that your premier has agreed to postpone the referendum given the opposition of area mayors uh, to the idea. Um, but I know that the plan is still to have the referendum. I, I will just say that personally, I'm not a fan of democracy by plebiscites. Uh, I was raised, went to school, and learned about democracy in a different era. Democracy is founded on representative democracy or an indirect form of democracy with elected officials 
whose role it is to represent a group of people. Their role is not just to communicate the public's wishes. Their role is to use their own judgment. And even on occasion when their views don't align with the majority. And I think democracy works best when the process includes filters. But in today's world, intermediaries are gone. And I will say that I think the line between, dem between democracy by plebiscite and mob rule is very thin. Judging from my own experience, that to develop a viable funding strategy, and we worked night and day on this for 12 weeks, for a multi-billion dollar transit plan, which you're faced with and we're faced with, cannot be easily translated into a single referendum question. There's also an interesting article in this morning's Globe and Mail. I don't know if any of you saw it on Denver. And it was, it was very relevant because there they had a funding referendum, and this was back in the last century, 1997, and it failed. And, why, and, and it did pass seven years later, 2004. And why did it pass? And by the way, Denver's the same size as Van, Metro Vancouver, about two and a half million people. Why did it pass? for two reasons, to me, came out of the story. First, they had the time for the specifics of the projects to come out and people could understand what it meant to them. There was time for them to absorb it and internalize it. It wasn't like this. And secondly, it was time to allow all the sectors to come together, and in particular, the business sector. And actually, it was the business leaders in Denver who championed it and who raised a significant amount of money to pay for the marketing plan. So. I hope that that happens here, that you can get all of the sectors together behind what it is, that the plan that you want to build. Um, but in, and in that case, they did pass the referendum. Um, even so, as I say, I, 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 I'm not a fan of referendums, but in this case, it took seven years for, to go from the initial referendum to getting the referendum, uh, the positive result. So how do you deal with it? What is the answer on the messaging? Uh, it's, it's not an easy answer because it requires really relentless energy and constant and you can't give up. It's like you're in a marathon and you have to keep running it and there's no end. Um, ongoing communication and engagement with the public from every single source, using all of the available channels and with the support from all sectors. And, and the support of uh, business, I think, can play a particularly important role in, trans in transit and I think they should because they, they, they are the key beneficiaries, the employers. And I guess on the communication thing, to me, the key is that there's no shortcut. And uh, so that there's coalitions being formed in Toronto around it. Many of the groups are now partnering to getting together, being in favor of transit, and coming together even if they don't agree exactly on the precise plan. Um, and I think that's what has, that's the only way we can, it's, you have to create a movement in effect. Now the second lesson is about trust. As I mentioned, I talked about once trust is broken, it's hard to rebuild. So I think all of our proposals for a new dedicated standalone fund, for requirements on how the funds are reported on, for the insistence on up-to-date, publicly available business case analysis before decisions are made, all of that will help. It doesn't solve the problem. They are necessary building blocks. The reservoir of trust has been all but depleted by ongoing betrayals at all levels of government. Um, in our case, we had the gas plant scandal right on top of the Senate scandal. The fact that one's federal and one's permanent, it doesn't matter. It's just, there they go. There they go. And it's very hard. Um, why are so many people so prepared to believe the worst? And I think because in so many cases, institutions have proven untrustworthy. I think we have to be honest with that. And I'm not talking about governments, and I think this is a global issue, all institutions. And even uh, if, whether it's political or to church, it's, we're facing this issue uh, across the board. I've done a lot of work on governance at the Conference Board of Canada, and uh, this whole issue of trustworthiness and behaving in a trustworthy way so that you can have the trust uh, is, is right across. Um, did a lot of polls. On, uh, polls have been taken on trust. The interesting thing is that people, who do you think people trust the most? The people that they most trust are people like airline pilots and doctors. Why do they trust airline pilots? Because they have no choice. When you're in a, I know I trust the airline pilot because what am I gonna do about it if I don't? I don't think I could do his job. I'm back there and I'm hoping that he's awake and that he is, that the, they filled up the, you know, I am hoping that, but I have to have trust. When I'm, if you're having surgery, all oh, everybody here has been to the, what, what, what choice is there? You have to have trust. 
whether you're a car salesman or a lawyer or a politician, you're at the bottom because everybody thinks they can do your job and um, uh, they feel that they therefore should have more control. It's just a curious thing. I want to make the point that I think the changes in structure are only part of the answer. In the end, I think it's about leadership and values. And because leadership is situational, this is a, this is a, a whole lecture combined into one sentence. There's no single formula for effective leadership, despite the many, many books that offer one. Context, culture, and character are the key determinants. Now, that's a whole other separate issue. But the third and final lesson won't surprise you. It's about governance. And my experience with the panel has confirmed how difficult and how challenging it is to find the ideal framework. So, and after pondering this question for now, about three decades, and writing about it, I don't have an easy answer. Um, uh, the report that was done for the mayor's council here, uh, which uh, Ken and others helped to write, um, uh, you had your key principles. Uh, when I did the report on Greater Toronto, going back 1996, we also looked at coordination to foster regional identity and uh, account uh, accountability and responsiveness and fairness and efficiency. I think agreement on the principles is easy. Um, but I think the key point about governance is that there's going to be inherent tensions in all of this because no single structure can satisfy it. Between local responsiveness and region-wide coordination, there is going to have to be some compromise and trade-offs, and that is the key. So creating a region-wide governance structure across boundaries will involve trade-offs, and the optimal balance is ultimately a question of judgment. The, the point I would make here is that you really can't learn. For, I don't think it's easy to create a, a template and pass it on. I think what works in Toronto will be different than from Vancouver. You have a different culture, a different history, a different way of working together, and we have our uh, a different way. Uh, well, now ours is very different. But um, uh, preceding this period, it was different, but not in, in this way. Um, uh, so I still feel that what I had proposed 20 years ago, actually, I still think it makes sense. But uh, in our case, politics did trump reason. And um, we had, uh, when they amalgamated Toronto, they created something called the Greater Toronto Services Board, which lasted uh, about a minute. Um, it ceased to exist. It was created in 1998. It was disbanded in 2001. It had very little power other than the responsibility for Go Transit, which then, of course, went to Metrolinx. So when Metrolinx came into being in 2007, it was in an awkward situation. As I pointed out, it was a regional transit board with no accountability to any of the local municipalities of the region and no power to raise taxes. It's accountable to the minister. Um, so it's hard for Metrolinx to develop smooth and productive relationships with those responsible for land use planning and economic development. I think it does a great job at running Go, Go Transit. Everybody thinks it does. To be honest, Go Transit was always well run. So it's not like it invented good management for it, but it's doing a very, very good job. It deserves real credit for the creation of this region-wide plan. But there are issues. And as I pointed out, Metrolinx got caught up in the debate over the Scarborough. Uh, it got caught up in the political fray. Metrolinx said it wanted an LRT. It made the right proposal. Then the ministry said, well, think again. And that made it awkward. So Metrolinx thought again and said, well, we can support an LRT. We can support a subway too. And then it had a bunch of conditions. But of course, it was a three-page letter. But nobody read the conditions. And um, the conditions, one of the conditions is that a, business, that a business case evaluation demonstrates that it's viable, which I don't think it will. But to the public, it appears that Metrolinx caved, unfortunately. In doing the research for our report, I anticipated being able to turn to TransLink as the model for the Greater Toronto Area to follow. But the report that I referenced the, to the Mayor's Council, uh, for, done for the Mayor's Council on Regional Transportation uh, just recently in 2013, suggests that more thinking is needed. While TransLink is state of the art, it says, what, with respect to scope and mandate and funding sources, it does not meet the test of good governance with respect to accountability. I want to say in, in conclusion that those who care about cities across the country pay attention to your progress here. We see you as the city re region that, uh, as Mike Harcourt said, mostly got it right. Most, uh, that's how we see you, Mike. To us, TransLink sent the benchmark for regional transportation governance, both in terms of funding and governance. Now it appears, maybe I don't want to overstate it, but based on what I've heard for the last two days, that this reputation could be at risk. So as I said to my own premier, there's much at stake. 
A good regional transportation network is a cornerstone of a, of a productive metropolitan economy that benefits everyone. In the case of Toronto, congestion and transit crowding have reached the tipping point. Unless we choose to expand our transit infrastructure to offer choice and entice thousands of commuters out of their cars and connect the people to jobs, we're going to pay a steep price. So the consequences of saying no to transit investment, more congestion and gridlock, billions more dollars lost, in, uh, lost in, in lost productivity, loss of business investment, a poorer quality of right, life for soon to be 10 million people living in our region. Surely the same can be said for Metro Vancouver. In global rankings, you sit at the top. Thanks to your diversified economy, high quality of life, location, concern for the environment, and integrated approach to land use and transportation planning. This worldwide reputation for liv livability gives you a real advantage in attracting top talent. But our global economy is highly competitive, and city regions like mine and yours cannot rest on past laurels. Both of our city regions are at critical decision points in our ability to accommodate predicted growth. Both of our city regions play pivotal role, roles in our provincial economies. Interestingly, we're both almost half, you're about half of your GDP of the province, and we're about 45%. So it's interesting, we both play these pivotal roles. Both of us must choose to invest in transportation expansion to ensure success going for, forward. And in both cases, the political context is fragile. Champions are needed now who will communicate the importance of investing in region-wide networks and who appreciate the value of regional governance in this new era of city regions. This is a worthy endeavor, one that must engage governments, business leaders, civil society, and academic institutions. And I congratulate you, Simon Fraser, for taking the lead. Thank you.